So today we are going to talk about triangle centers and today's going to be a vocab day and using that vocabulary to start identifying different triangle centers. So some things we need to know first, we need to know what a perpendicular bisector and the angle bisector are. These should sound familiar from math two, but just to remind you, one important thing for a perpendicular bisector is it does not have to come from the vertex. Some other important vocab words are median and altitude. Median comes from the vertex and divides the other side in half, and an altitude comes from the vertex and is perpendicular to the other side. All right, so a circumcenter. Now we're going to actually start talking about what these centers are and what creates them. So looking here, if you look at this triangle here, I see the perpendicular sign and I see that these are congruent which tells me that this is created by perpendicular bisectors. So important facts, this is that the circumcenter is equidistant from the vertex of each triangle. So that tells me that M is equidistant from A, C, and B. So let's see, I have one, two, and three tick marks. So I could put, technically, I could put four tick marks, oops, that's not the right one, on those four pieces. So I know that A, M, is congruent to BM, which is congruent to CM. So circumcenter, you should see perpendicular bisectors on the outside of your triangle, and that's how we know that it is a circumcenter. And in center, You'll notice I have double tick marks inside each of my main vertex angles. So that tells me this is created by an, these angle bisectors. So the in center is equidistant from the side of the triangle. So that tells me M is equidistant from these points here on the sides of the triangles. So a circumcenter, the center is equidistant from the vertexes or vertices, let me use proper English. Uh, with the in center, it's equidistant from these points that are on the side of our triangles. So that tells me that XM would be congruent to YM and ZM. Let's make that actually look like a Z. All right. Next one is a centroid. Looking here, I have those tick marks on the outside showing that these are equidistant, or excuse me, uh, congruent. So AX and BX are congruent, but I don't have the perpendicular sign. So that tells me these are created by medians because a median does not have to be perpendicular. So a centroid 
is created by a vertex connected to the median of the opposite side. So let's see, let's start with A, M. Now here's where it gets a little funky. Because I'm dealing with these triangles, this is a two thirds and one third ratio. So it's not half and half in the center, dealing with things around the vertex. So I'm just going to look at this here. Now it will be the same for the other two, but we're just going to look at A, Y and relationships between A, M and Y, M or M, Y, however you want to write it. So I'm going to start first. The line segment AM is actually two of the line segments of MY. Okay, so one of these is made up by two of these. So technically, there's three of these segments that are congruent to MY because I could put another one here. So I would see two of them over here, and then a third one on this side. So another way that I could write this is that MY is one half of AM. Now, if I'm using the, the chunks of three, I'm going to look at the entire line, and I'm going to make a statement about AM in comparison to AY, and I'm going to make a statement about MY in comparison to AY. So I'm going to come over here so I have a little bit more room. So if I look at AM, Remember, AY has been cut up into thirds, so AM is two-thirds of the full length of AY because there's two of those chunks in here. And for MY, well, that's the other piece, so that would be one-third of AY. And again, I can make all of these statements for line segment CX and for line segment BZ. And they're all going to be those same comparisons to each other. Two thirds for the big chunk, one third for the small chunk. And then the small chunk is half of the big chunk. All right, last but not least on our graphic organizer, we have the orthocenter. So many fun words to learn. All right, let's see. On the outside here, I don't have any tick marks about side lengths. All I see is this perpendicular sign, so that tells me these are created by altitudes. So the orthocenter is created by a vertex connected to the opposite side so that it is perpendicular to that side. Excuse me, this is supposed to say altitude, not orthocenter. Oy vey. 
This is supposed to say altitude. Just kidding. So my altitude is the vertex dropping down to the opposite side so that it's perpendicular. And then those three altitudes inside of my triangle is what creates my orthocenter. All right, let's try some example problems. Woo! All right, so C is a circumcenter, which means I have perpendicular bisectors. So that means we're going to be dealing with some congruent sides. So let's start here on the top. So AT and TM are going to be congruent. Now I'm not going to let this distract me. I'm thinking of all of TM here. On this side, I'm going to have MO being congruent to OP. And then along this side, I've got AD and DP. <laughs> All right. So I have AC being 12. That's already labeled. MP. So this whole side is 14. And then TM is 10. Oh, and then AD. I missed that one. And AD is 8. So I need to find AT. Well, AT is congruent to TM. So this would also be 10. CM here. Now, with our circumcenter, the circumcenter to the vertices are all congruent. So I can put four tick marks there. From C to my vertex M, I can put four tick marks there. And from C to vertex P, I can also put four tick marks there. So that tells me all three of those are 12. So CM is 12. And then DP would be eight. So if they had asked us to find MO or OP, since this is the perpendicular bisector, it would cut 14 in half. So both of those would be seven. If it asked us, it didn't, but if it did. All right, next one. Now I have an in center, which means my angles are bisected. And they are the same distance to the sides. So that means XM is going to be congruent to BX and X A. That looks like an A, right? I don't have my glasses on. So XM, BX, and XA are all six. C, P, O. So this big angle here is 52 degrees. So 
Well, since this is 40, I know angle 2 also has to be 40 degrees because they're bisected, so this is 40. And then I have to find BOX. So the next thing I have to find is this angle here. That's my last thing to find. Well, I can find this big angle here, B -O, or excuse me, COP, by doing 360 minus 52, because that's this angle here. Excuse me, 180, not 360. Lord Bethany, almighty. I promise my brain knows what I'm doing. It's 180 because we're inside a triangle, not a quadrilateral like yesterday. So I'm going to do 180 minus 52 minus this whole angle here is 80. So that tells me that angle COP is 48. And then if I cut that in half, that will tell me what this angle is here. So angle BOX should be 24 degrees. Now we have a centroid. So that's a whole bunch of medians. So that means all of these sides here on the outside are congruent because M, R, and Y are media, or excuse me, midpoints, cutting those sides directly in half. So P, R is 12. P, T is 8. A, R is 9. And a y, this whole side here, is 21. All right. So let's start on the outside. So a r, I need to find a t. Well, if these are congruent, that means this is 9. So both of these together makes a t. 18. Now let's go to the inside. So if this whole, well, let's start with PR. Remember, there are two of these inside of SP. So if I double 12, it will tell me what SP is. So this should be. 24. I'm going to take AY and find PY here. This piece here is a third of my whole segment. So if I divide this by 3, that tells me that PY should be 7. Similar thing here as to what we did for SR. This PT is 8. This is double what PM is. So PM is 4. So then TM, this whole thing, is 8 and 4 added together, which would be 12. All right, last but not least, true, false. And if something is false, we're going to fix it. Perpendicular bi a bisector of a triangle is never the same segment as the angle bisector. Well, that's actually not true. And there's one special case where this would work. If we have a equilateral triangle, 
this will be true because it will not only bisect the sides, it will also bisect the angles. So I would say this is sometimes, and my special case is that they are the same in an equilateral triangle. Angle bisectors of a scaling triangle intersect. Well, we didn't look at anything intersecting outside the triangle, so that's false. This is inside. Perpendicular bisectors of a right triangle intersect on the triangle. Well, that just doesn't make any sense. We should say inside, not on the triangle, but inside the triangle. Altitude from the vertex angle of an isosceles triangle is always the median. Well, let's draw ourselves a picture. If I have an isosceles triangle, oh, it helps if it's not in the way. If I drop down a median, well, the only way that this works is if it goes to, or excuse me, I'm dropping down an altitude, and the only way that that works is if, because this is an isosceles triangle, if it connects to the midpoint of that base. So this is actually a true statement. The center of balance of the triangle is the in-center. Well, that's actually not the in-center. That's a centroid. So that's a big F there. To find the point that is equidistant from the sides, you need to find the circumcenter. Well, sides go with in center. So I could change this in one of two ways. I could change this to in center. Or if I changed sides, I could do angles and circumcenter. And then lastly, the median starts at a vertex and goes to the opposite midpoint. That's actually true. So we only had two true statements in this one. This last section here, we're going to have that as an exit ticket in class today. So I want you to answer these questions. And I'll put a, uh, a little document on Canvas that you can upload your answers to this with.